Man, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of EOS. 1090J, man, I'm rocking with y'all and y'all rocking with me. I got my buzz light, yeah, out. I'm kind of feeling a little bit tattered today, you know what I mean? I feel like even, you know, when I stamp on a new tattoo, I still don't feel tatted. Because some of them boys I was around in prison, all the way wet up. So I still feel like I'm slacking a little piece, but I'm getting there, you feel me? This video right here is finna be about my brother Savage. I want y'all to have an open mind when you hear about his case because Savage unfortunately was convicted of a second degree murder. And um, a lot of people, when it comes to cases like this, they're quick to pick a side. You know, you're either gonna side with the victim are you going to side with the killer? And for this video here, I want to let it be known now I'm not siding with either person. And it's unfortunate what happened. You know, someone's life tragically ended or someone else's life, their freedom was taken away and they're forced to live inside of a society that thrives on violence, anger, and aggression. I met Savage at Appalachia CI. I'm not sure if it was 2014 or 15. I think it was 2014. I believe he was in the dorm for New Year's. But um, he actually had a name at that compound before I even got there. So Savage was in the YO dorm at Appalachia. He was also in there with TK, Mad Max, a few other people. And he, he lives up to his name. He is... What he says he is, and people know his reputation, and it's not a reputation to glorify, but understand in that society, you have to be that way. You build that reputation, and being that savage, unfortunately, was locked up so young. When you're in these youth offender dorms, youth offender prisons, violence is like your way to stardom. The more violent you are, the more aggressive the faster you are to hurt somebody, it builds your reputation on that compound. And it's sad to say you can even get respect from the correctional officers by inflicting violence on other inmates. CEOs will respect the fact that you don't take any shit. Some CEOs shouldn't be CEOs. They love to glorify the violence. At Lancaster, you know, CEOs used to talk about the best cutting they ever saw, meaning who got cut the worst? How bad was it? Oh, his cheek was detached. Oh, his finger was hanging off. Oh, he had to get air flighted because he almost bled out. They used to talk about these things as if they weren't real life events, as if they were kills on Call of Duty. Who got the best kill cam? But that's how it is inside of prison and inmates are the same way. We would compete about who could get who the best. We would compete about who had the most people under extortion. We thrived in it. We loved it. We embraced it because we didn't have an option. The other side to it was being the victim, was being the person on the other end of the blade or being the person that checked in, being the person that's getting bullied, that's getting extorted, that's even getting raped. But that was more so prevalent at the adult prisons. When I met Savage, we was cool off rip. You know what I'm saying? That was bro. And um, he just, he had a very cocky, confident attitude about him. You know, he used to be the favorite to a lot of the female CEOs. They feel like they watched you grow up, especially like with Red Light, who was 14 when he went to prison. The staff at Lancaster, they were fucked up about Red Light. And even they heard some of the rumors about his murder. You know what I mean? He said when he went back to prison that he ran into staff that knew him and they felt like they raised him. And they were happy to see he was still alive and breathing because we all thought he was killed. Savage didn't play any games whatsoever. And if it was time to go to war, he was ready. He was one of the people that wanted to be the first to strike he wanted to pop it off. He had a lot of balls and I got a lot of respect for him. I remember one time I was in my cell, two bottom, the same cell I shared with Bimba. I'm sharpening up a knife 
on the bottom bunk. I'm getting it right. My bunk was the top bunk. Bimba's bunk was the bottom. Now, before y'all start saying some shit, oh, I heard if you're on the top bunk, da da da. Listen, when you're in the DOC, you don't get to choose bunks. You're assigned a bunk. So when they come around for count time, it's going to say upper or lower. If you're on the wrong bunk, the CO is going to make you move. If you don't move, that's the disciplinary report. Disobeying a verbal order, 30 days in fucking confinement. But honestly, I liked the top bunk because when you're on the bottom bunk and you got to sit up for count, you got somebody's feet dangling by your head. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not on that shit. So I kind of liked having that second story, you know what I mean? My second story apartment. But I'm in there and I'm shopping it up a knife and I can hear somebody talking. And it's this dude who was in the corner outside of the cells talking to some old schools. And when I say old schools, I mean like 60, 70 years old. He's talking to some real older inmates. He was like 30 something. I don't know why he wanted to have this conversation because they didn't entertain the conversation. I could hear everything that was being said. See, what I used to do a lot was I would put headphones in, but not be listening to anything. I used to do that a lot just so I could peep game, just so I could hear things that maybe weren't intended for me to hear. And I heard him talking and he was speaking indirectly saying, oh, you got jits in here shopping and knives because they can't fight because they scared to throw hands. So I walk outside of my cell to see who's talking. Mind you, I got the headphones on. So I do a little look around and I see him. His cell was on the complete other side of the dorm, way at the end. He didn't like me because one day I walked into his cell without permission. There was an empty bunk in there. This was known as like a gunning room, basically. People used to go in this room to look out the window to gun down the COs that was outside. Because they would stand right outside and smoke cigarettes and shit. So I shot off into this room, not to gun or do anything like that, but because I was actually getting shit off of this CO. And she was right outside. We used to have a routine. He recently got put into this cell. I think he was in the shower or something. I bang on the window and I'm more or less signing the female CO. And she knew sign language. I used to you know what I'm saying? Try to teach her the shit. She would go home and study the shit. And I told her, hey, for the next day, shoot me, you know, and I give her a number of five, whatever cigarettes, however much it was. You know what I'm saying? So after I'm done signing her, I turn around. He comes into the cell. And he's like, yo, what's up? Why are you in my cell? I'm like, oh, I'm handling business right now, but I'm done though. He's like, hey, bro, before you ever come in my cell. So I'm like, man, what? Like, what you talking about? Like, what's up? So he's like, oh, you want to handle it like that? I'm like, how you trying to handle it, bro? Like, you know what I'm doing in here. Ain't nobody touching your shit. Like, honestly, you was a fucking bum. Ain't nobody fucking with your shit. He didn't have nothing. Like I said, he was a 30-year-old black dude. He was kind of cocky. The reason nobody fucked with him, and when I say fuck with him, I don't mean in the sense that they were scared. Nobody associated with him because he associated with boys. A boy is a punk. A boy... He might not even be gay, but he's the one that's getting it. You know what I'm saying? He's the one that everybody's running through that's a booty bandit. So he used to associate with boys, but say he wasn't gay. He just liked talking to them. Like, come on, bro. Come on, bro. What you talking to them for if you're not entertaining that? You know what I'm saying? So I already didn't respect dude like that. So I'm more or less like, what's up? I'm on whatever type of time you want. He's like, all right, bet. I walk out of his cell. I strapped up real quick. He came out and he went and talked to one of my brothers and shit. So he goes and talked to my brother. And my brother's like, man, that shit dead, bro. It's dead. Because if it ain't dead, we finna handle it right now. And dude more or less was like, oh, nah. I don't know if he thought he would get some type of justification. Being that he's black. And the majority of my brothers in that dorm were black. I had maybe like one Spanish brother, which was Bebo. But, um... Yeah, my brothers are finna kill you before they violate me. You know what I'm saying? And at the same time, everybody knew in that dorm what I was doing. Everybody knew I was locked in with that CO. And not only that, I was blessing a lot of people. I was bringing bleach in from the bubble. I was bringing uh, extra whites like socks, t-shirts, whatever, whatever. You know what I'm saying? When you got money coming in, when you circulating shit, you in a sense have to make everybody happy. 
Because if you're the only one eating inside of the dorm, somebody's going to drop a kite on you. They're going to write a little note. It's going to be a fake sick call. It's going to say inmate da 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 in this cell is doing this. And I'm going to get put on their investigation. And now everything that's coming in the dorm stops. It doesn't mean I fucked with everybody though. I only fucked with solid people. I didn't talk to the punks. I didn't talk to the jizzles. And that's just how it is in prison. You're not going to fuck with someone you feel is on a lower social class than you because you don't have the same respect as me. You see what I'm saying? But even if somebody's in a different gang or a different home team, you're gonna respect that gangster. There's a mutual respect inside of the prison system. And at the same time, certain people, like clean freaks, people that love to bleach their room, they're gonna pay top dollar for that bleach. I'm the plug. You wanna smoke tobacco? I'm the plug. You want some K2? I'm the plug. Whatever it is, I'm the motherfucking plug in this bitch. And I wasn't the only plug but it pretty much circulated around my group. You know what I'm saying? Like my people pretty much had everything on lock. This was just the specific shit that I had on lock. So when I came out of the cell and I heard him saying that shit, I'm thinking to myself, I bet he still feels some type of way. Now he's talking about me. This is something that has to get handled, right? So I go back in the room. I go back to shopping and up the knife. And I kind of thought it was ballsy that dude was talking shit while I'm shopping a knife. But the thing is, he was talking about fighting. So what I assumed is he's just going to want a one-on-one. -on -one. He's not going to want to take it there with the iron because for one, he most likely is too broke to even get a knife. You know, knives were going for like 50 to $100 depending on who you knew. You couldn't just get a knife, especially if you weren't nobody. Nobody's going to just give you the material. That shit gets sold. You see what I'm saying? No one's just going to freely give you something unless you somebody with a little bit of rank. If you got some pull, someone will look out for you in two seconds. But like I said, he wasn't nobody. So as I'm shopping this knife, Savage comes in the room. I put him up on beat. I'm like, hey, bro, you see food that's like four cells down? So he's like, yeah, da, da, da. So I tell him about what he said. The previous little interaction he already knew about. And I told Savage, I was like, bro, listen, for breakfast, when we go to chow, we got to lock into the salad port. So when we get in the salad port, y'all just stand around me. You feel me? This dude right here, he usually just stayed in the middle. You got some people that always want to be the first in line every single chow. You got some people that always want to be in the back. But the most dangerous spot to be in is the middle. And because he was really a nobody, you know, the front and the back was usually controlled by gangs or home teams. He just stayed in the middle. And I mean, they pile up like 80 of us into this little salad port. The front door that we leave through is locked until the bars are closed behind us. So we're stuck in this little thing. There's no camera until you actually get outside. From behind, the sergeant can see us from the bubble. But when all of us are scooched together, they really don't know what's going on. So my plan was when we get in the salad port, the second that front door pops, I'm going to shove the fucking knife in his neck. He's going to freak the fuck out. He's going to be holding his shit. Blood's going to get every motherfucking way because I'm going to pull that motherfucker back out and we're going to haul ass. And what's going to happen is when I pull that knife out, blood's getting on every fucking body. When I get outside, I'm throwing the goddamn knife because the camera isn't going to see me immediately. Huh. The knife gets thrown. He's stuck. Whatever happens to him, happens to him. There's blood everywhere. I'm not going to be the only one that goes under investigation. If I go under investigation, I'm pretty confident I'm going to beat this shit. But this is how it's going to get done. This is how I'm going to handle it. I'm just going to tag this motherfucker. And that's it. I'm not going to throw hands with you. Why? You associate with boys. You're black. You're over 30 years old and you're talking to boys. I'm going to assume you're sick. I'm going to assume you got some shit. AIDS, whatever it is. I'm not risking it. I'm just going to wet you up. I tell Savage this, and Savage is like, man, bro, what the fuck? So he asked me, he's like, bro, when you going home, bro? I was like, a couple of months. He's like, so what the fuck you finna do that for? I'm like, bro, fuck him. This is how we finna do it. My mentality was wild as shit in prison because at the end of the day, I was trying to live up to my brothers. My brothers was doing ridiculous amounts of time. You know, goo, 50 years. Bebo, like 25 years. Savage, 23 years. Motherfucking Shug, life. A lot of them boys just had ridiculous amounts of time. And at the end of the day, a lot of our enemies, our opposition, 
had a lot of motherfucking time. So when we go to war and we get into it, I can't just be like, oh, I'm gonna beef with that one because he, you know, got the least amount of time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ride out on him. He only got three years. Nah, I might have to go head up with somebody that got life. So Savage, being the big brother that he is, he was like, fuck that. He walked out of the cell and told Buddy to come into the cell. I didn't want him to do that because I didn't want him to know that I knew. You see what I'm saying? I wanted to just take him by surprise and get it over with. Savage calls him in the cell. He's like, what's up, bro? You got a problem with my brother? And dude's just like, what you talking about? He's like, man, fuck that. You got a problem with my brother? What's up? Man, what y'all trying to do? Like, I'm saying, like, what y'all... Mind you, I'm sitting here shopping this big fucking knife. I got the motherfucker sitting right here. So, you know, Savage is just like, I'm saying, bro, you got a problem with him. Say something now. Like, let it be known now. So he's like, oh, that's what y'all on? Okay, hold up. Let me go to my cell real quick. So he walks out to go to his cell. I immediately stand up with the knife, put it behind me, and come up out the cell. Because he is indirectly saying he's going to go get a knife or get a strap, whatever he has. I'm not going to let him go get it. I'm going to hit him up before he gets it. So if I got to hit him up in the day room, it is what it is. I'm going to wet him up in the day room. Savage grabs him. He's like, nah, bro, don't do that, bro. We ain't on nothing crazy. Just come in the cell. So he comes back in. And by doing that, it was understood that if he goes and gets that or tries to get that, we're going to do what we got to do. You know what I'm saying? And at that point, he pretty much caught please, said he ain't got no problem, this, that, and the third. But I appreciated what Savage did. And I say that because a lot of people want you to do violent acts. A lot of people want you to be on the shit that they're on. A lot of people want you to crash out and don't want to see you go home. And people ask me all the time, why do you hold down your brother's as much as you do, because if roles were reversed, do you think they would do that for you? They did that for me. Their actions in prison did that for me. Savage, Goo, Bimba, a lot of my brothers made choices that helped me and secured my EOS. You understand what I'm saying? They made choices that helped me go home. That's why I had that loyalty to my brothers, because had they not done that, had I made that decision to stab that dude with Rambo and Goo didn't call it off, had I stabbed this one and Savage didn't call it off, had Bimba not been there with me and rolled out with me, I could have got killed. So many different situations where their loyalty was part of the reason I came home. So I'm always going to extend that same love and loyalty back to them until they EOS and until they're in the same position that I'm in. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Savage's case. Nafiz Lowry, now 19, gets 23 years for a murder he committed when he was 16. The family members of a slain Hastings man all described their loved one in similar ways as they waited for one of the two men accused of killing him to be sentenced Friday. Terrell Timo Moore was a protector, someone who could always make you laugh and love to help his sprawling family of 11 siblings and countless nieces, nephews, and cousins, each one said. Whenever I need someone, he was there, and whenever he was around, you felt a sense of protection, said his baby brother. Moore was murdered in Hastings on August 27th, 2009, possibly in retaliation for stealing from the two teens who later killed him and buried his body in blankets and leaves in the woods. Nafiz Lowry, 16 at the time, pleaded guilty to second degree murder as part of a plea deal that would have him serve 20 to 23 years in prison. Lowry is now 19. Circuit Court Judge Berger sentenced him to 23 years on Friday. Lowry's co-defendant, Travis Blakely of Clermont was 18 at the time of the shooting. Prosecutors say he was the one who pulled the trigger. Blakely faces a charge of first degree murder with a firearm and is set for jury trial May 21st, court records show. Shortly before his sentencing, Lowry made a brief and hard to hear apology to the family. His mother asked Berger to have mercy on her son, saying he had lost his father and grandfather close to one another in 2008. 
the year before the murder. But Berger remarked on the irony that Lowry then went on to deprive Moore's two sons of their father. Mr. Lowry, you can't take the law into your own hands, she said. In the past few weeks, the entire country has gotten a lesson in that. Before she handed down the sentence, Berger turned to wooden benches packed with Moore's family members of varying ages and addressed her remarks to the children. She remarked that Moore had been in her courtroom before, but that he had always been respectful. Your father, your uncle, will want you to do well in school, respect people, and not make the same mistakes, she said, to make something of your lives and make him proud. Moore has a long record, court records show. He faced a long list of serious charges and was found guilty of some of them. His family members say he was no angel, but he was a loving brother, cousin, uncle, and friend who would clean out his mother's barn in South Carolina and string up her Christmas lights or take his young cousins out of the house so they wouldn't be bored. His mother, Miss Warren, says she left her South Carolina home to move back to the county after Moore's death. Several family members say they weren't hoping for a specific sentence. No sentence makes it better, Warren said. There's no justice for murder. More than three years after the killing of a Hastings man, Terrell Moore, his case was finally laid to rest Wednesday. In a hearing full of emotion and apologies, Travis Blakely, 21, was sentenced to a 23-year prison term in the second-degree murder case. Just before the sentence was issued by Judge Trainer. Blakely turned from his chair at the defense table and addressed Moore's family directly. I'm really sorry about what happened, he said. I know the pain it caused you. Blakely's sentence was the same that co-defendant Nafiz Lowry received after reaching a plea agreement a year and a half ago. He will receive credit for the 1,264 days he has served in the county jail since his arrest. There is no dispute that Blakely shot Moore in the head on the night of August 27, 2009 in Hastings. Exactly how it took place and the reasons surrounding Moore's slaying are murkier. The accounting of those details filled much of Wednesday's hearing, but didn't add up to much in Trainer's view. The fact is, guns were taken to a house, Trainer said. There's nothing good that's going to come out of that. Hopefully you will use this time to learn from your mistakes. Blakely said Moore robbed and beat him two days before the murder. During his testimony, Blakely said he had just received his assistance check from the state two days before the murder. He said he cashed the $1,135 check and bought a few things before playing cards and smoking marijuana with Moore, Lowry, and other friends. On the way home, Blakely said Moore punched him many times and took his cash and even the shoes on his feet. He also said Lowry was robbed in the same incident, even though Lowry was carrying a gun at the time. After taking some grief from mutual friends for not doing something about the robbery, Blakely said that on the night of August 27, 2009, Lowry took a gun to the place where Moore was staying in order to get the money back. After Moore was awakened by Lowry, Blakely ended up with the gun and claimed he accidentally shot Moore. Out of the corner of my eye, I seen Terrell jump, Blakely said Wednesday in his testimony. I fell back and hit my head and the gun went off. Defense attorney Quarles asked if he meant to shoot Moore. No, he answered. St. John's County Sheriff Office, Detective Hines, who testified prior to Blakely, but was one of the officers who interviewed him during the investigation, said she knew Blakely was calling the incident an accident. She also expressed extreme skepticism that Moore could have been shot in the head by someone who wasn't aiming. He described it as an accident, she said. It would have been a very lucky shot if it was an accident. In addition to presenting the facts of the case, both sides brought forth family members to speak about the victim and the defendant. Moore, despite some trouble with the law, was portrayed as a loving son and father. Blakely was shown to be a young man who was abandoned by his mother as a toddler, living in motels or in a car with his father, and eventually going to a group home until he was 18. I wasn't with him at all, Father Mark Blakely said of his son's early childhood. I feel responsible for him to be here right now.
Before sitting back down on the benches behind the defense table, the father turned and apologized quietly to the collection of Moore's family members, many of whom were wearing t-shirts with an image of Moore's face on them. Moore's mother, Miss Warren, struggled to maintain her composure throughout the hearing, almost collapsing on the bench during testimony. At one point, she left the courtroom but could still be heard wailing in the hallway. When given an opportunity to address the court, she read a letter she prepared for the sentencing. Every day I am haunted by this act, she said. I would give anything just to hear that voice again. I still can't get over that violent act. Adding to the sadness, Assistant State Attorney Lewis presented a photo of Moore with his children. Then a letter from Moore's son was read. I think the person who shot my dad should go to jail forever. Now people ask me, why do I say free somebody when they're guilty of the crime that they committed, right? He pled guilty, his co-defendant pled guilty. How I feel about it is none of it should have taken place. What they didn't address in the court, or at least I couldn't find, was the fact that Savage was 16 at the time. His co-defendant, Travis, was 18 at the time. Terrell Moore, the victim in this case, was 28 years old. Not only that, Travis is about my height, six foot six one. Savage is a little bit shorter than me. The 28 year old man that allegedly robbed him the day before this murder took place was 6'5", 205 pounds. There should be no 28 year olds that are 6'5", over 200 pounds, robbing 18 and 16 year olds. It shouldn't be happening, but that doesn't justify the murder. It doesn't. There's no justification for murder, right? That's what we're told. Savage pot in the murder was the fact that it said he brought the gun to the place. The gun was put in the other man's hands who the money was taken from. The victim got shot in the head. They took the body. They buried him in the woods under blankets and under leaves. And I believe it was a jogger or somebody walking by the woods that found the body. And uh, witnesses pretty much told that it was Savage and Travis that did it. And it's sad. It's sad because someone lost their life. But also you got two young men that have very fucked up upbringings. You know what I mean? Savage losing his father and grandfather a year before the murder. The fact that Savage was 16 and walking around with a gun, that's not a normal thing. You know he's got some shit going on in his head. You know what I'm saying? The fact that Travis grew up inside of group homes. His parents went there for him. I got a lot of respect for Savage. And one thing that bothers me about everything is the fact that I know he has that name, that alias, Savage because of the way he's had to grow up inside of the system because of the reputation he's had to maintain since the day he was arrested at 16 years old and I hope that throughout the years until his release date it doesn't completely traumatize him because I got to see that real authentic side of him I got to see the compassion I got to see the maturity, the fact that he was able to look out for me and help me and make the decision for me now. We're going to confront him now. We're going to dead this issue now because I don't want to see you do something that's irreversible. I don't want to see you for the rest of my bed. I want you to go home and I want to see you when I get home. You know what I'm saying? It's like I'm at a loss for words. It's like, what's realer than that? When somebody looks out for you in that way. When somebody is looking out for your future. You know what I mean? That's growth. That shows growth as a person. That shows maturity. And I just hope that a lot of the shit that he's going through inside of prison, he's able to overcome. Because he has been under investigation for violence inside of prison. He has done what he has to do to survive inside of Florida State Prison. As we all have. 
You know, there's not too many people that come on my channel and just that like, oh yeah, I went to Florida State Prison, nothing happened, I was good. Pretty much everybody that has a channel or has done time in Florida will speak on some form of violence that they were in unless they were the victim. And they usually don't want to talk about nothing, you know what I'm saying? But unless you were a victim, you've you've done something to somebody else. You've hurt somebody else. And you know, the more people you hurt, the more desensitized you become. And that is the reason why I hope in some way or some form, Savage is able to get some of his time back because I don't want bro to come home and be so traumatized, he ends up just staying in there. I don't want him to build a fear before coming home that he's scared to come into society because he doesn't know society. He doesn't know if he'll be accepted into society. And he does something inside of prison that would keep him from coming home. You know, this is just, it's a fucking, it's a story that a lot of y'all can reflect on. It's a story that a lot of people can learn from. That as young as 16, you can make a decision that'll cost you the next 23 years of your life. And not only that, when you are released, who the fuck is hiring you with a second degree murder? You know what I mean? When I met him at Appalachia, his co-defendant was actually at Appalachia too. I remember him, white boy Travis. He used to play basketball. He'd be the only white boy playing basketball. And um, it's just, it's crazy. It's fucked up. But it's reality. And you know, rest in peace to the victim. At the end of the day, I'm not choosing sides. I'm not saying he was right. I'm not saying that the victim should be painted as a monster, 28 year old. You know, everybody makes fucked up decisions. And sometimes the outcome of that decision can change your life forever. Whether it be you die or you go to prison. But hey, it's 1090 Jake. I'm rocking with y'all and y'all rocking with me. Till next time. Yo, man, what's up, big brother, man? That ain't up, big brother, you did that, man. But oh, we miss you, man. We love you, bro. It's streets and chain gang, chain gang. It's the streets, man. We doing it, oh. Keep your head up, big brother, man. Y'all stay alive, man. Y'all stay fresh, man. Love you, boy. Be easy, bro.